Hello, I had to do all my beginning, um, kind of get stuff ready stuff, um, for a new audiobook that is basically just, um, well, since it's a continuing series, I move the book from, dang it, it's out of my file thing on Dropbox. Um, I move the character thing into the new seasons folder, or I copy it into so I have like a constant stream of so I can use the same voices. Um, and then I obviously make it, make the new file. Uh, songs, bite at a time. This one, save, pages. So we are starting on a new season. Rainbow Valley. Which for me is, I know some podcasts are like, um, they take breaks between seasons. I don't do that. It just flows one to the next. Each book is its own season. My stomach is making all kinds of noises right now. Each book is its own season. It starts over so that if you were to join the podcast now, um, I could have it set up as a, I don't remember what it's called. Basically, you have like three different options when you set up a podcast. It could be just like one where you do an episode every week. They're not really related to each other. You can listen to them in any order. Like you can set it up like that. Um, then you can set it up as, I think it's called a serial where it's like you have to do from beginning to end. Um, like you want to listen to them all in order. Um, that would be for ones that... It's like a single story on one podcast. So like the single podcast tells one story and then it's over essentially like an audiobook, um, like a single audiobook all by itself. Um, and then you have ones like mine where I have, I think it's episodic by seasons. So each season you have to listen to, have to, you don't have to, but um, it is recommended that you listen to the whole season from the beginning because it is a book you want to, I would want to be able to hear um, the beginning of the book before the end of the book. So that's how it's set up. So if you were to like subscribe today to, well, this is day one of a book, but if it was yesterday and it was the last chapter of Anne's House of Dreams, um, if you were to go into, you wouldn't want to just hear the last chapter of the book and that's it. So it will, when you go into the podcast directory, it'll be like, Hey, here's season Seven, 16? I think it was season 16 was Antasa Dreams. Um, so it'd be like, here's season 16. Here's all the episodes you haven't heard yet, which would be like all of them. And then you can click into and go to previous seasons as well. Um, and on my website, everything is like sorted and um, organized and by season where you can find all of it. Because eventually the podcast directories will only hold so many episodes. Um, but my website, I'm told if you use the embedded players, which I do, that they will be available there until, unless you delete them. Like if I were just to delete all of my episodes from my podcast host, which I wouldn't do. Even like when season one is like, <laughs> I did not listen through my audio at that point at all. Um, I also had not really learned my style yet at all. Um, so like I've improved and actually the Anne series is the first ones that I did start listening all the way through to every single episode. Um, so prior to this, I would not, <laughs> I did for audiobooks. Um, when I started doing fiction in January of 22, um, I did start listening through at that point, um, but yeah, no, because I had one book that went to the author and I'd kind of prior to that, I would kind of skim through and look for like spikes that shouldn't have been there. And then I'd listen to it and whatever. Um, and then I had one book I sent to the author and they were like, oh, there's, I don't remember what it was, something on the audio that I should have caught had I listened through it. Um, and so from that book on, that was like my second or third, it was very early into my doing fiction books, um, got that figured out. Anyways, what not to do. Um, one, I would recommend don't just jump jump in with both feet unless you are the type of person that learns very quickly on your feet. Thankfully, I am. Um, listen to audiobooks. Um, 
get a coach, especially if you want to like make it a full-time gig and be working for big publishers, get a coach. Um, that's, that's about, I take the coach on what needs work approach. Um, so breathing and like throat vocal health. I've done like, I, I actually went to singing lessons for that because I'm like, who's going to know how to do that? I mean, it's a little bit of a different ball game for audiobooks, but it's very similar to like if you were doing full on performances. Today we'll be starting, rain oh my god. Today we'll be starting Rainbow Valley by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 1. Home Again. Hold on. My voice is <clears throat> very um what's it called? Uh, fry. There's a lot of fry. This is going to be weird. Okay, maybe that'll work. Today we'll be starting Rainbow Valley by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 1. Home Again. It was a clear apple green evening in May, and Four Winds Harbor was mirroring back the clouds of the Golden West, between its softly dark shores. The sea moaned eerily on the sandbar, sorrowful even in spring, but a sly jovial wind came piping down the Red Harbor Road, along which Miss Cornelia's comfortable matronly figure was making its way towards the village of Glen St. Mary. Miss Cornelia was rightfully Mrs. Marshall Elliot, and had been Mrs. Marshall Elliot for thirteen years, but even yet... More people referred to her as Miss Cornelia than as Mrs. Elliot. To be clear, 13 years. So at the end of the previous book, she was just getting married, which means it has been 13 books, 13 years since Anne's House of Dreams ended, which is why there's a filler book that is not public domain in that gap. So it has been 13 years. The old name was dear to her old friends. Only one of them contemptuously dropped it. Susan Baker, the gray and grim and faithful handmaiden of the Blythe fam- Blythe. Susan Baker, the gray and grim and faithful handmaiden of the Blythe family at Ingleside, never lost an opportunity of calling her Mrs. Marshall Elliot, with the most killing and pointed emphasis, as if to say, you wanted to be Mrs. and Mrs. you shall be with a vengeance as far as I am concerned. Miss Cornelia was going up to Ingleside to see Dr. and Mrs. Blythe, who were just home from Europe. They had been away for three months, having left in February to attend a famous medical congress in London. And certain things which Miss Cornelia was anxious to discuss had taken place in the Glen during their absence. For one thing... There was a new family in the manse, and such a family. Miss Cornelia shook her head over them several times as she walked briskly along. Susan Baker and the Aunt Shirley of other days saw her coming as they sat on the big veranda at Ingleside, enjoying the charm of the cat's light, the sweetness of sleepy robins whistling among the twilight... Twilight? There's no... The sweetness of sleeping robins whistling among the tw twilight. <sighs> Dang it. <laughs> Where am I? The sweetness of sleepy robins whistling among the twilight maples, and the dance of a gusty group of daffodils blowing against the old, mellow red brick wall of the lawn. Anne was sitting on the steps, her hands clasped over her knee looking in the kind dusk as girlish as a mother of many has any right to be, and the beautiful gray-green eyes gazing down the harbor road were as full of unquenchable sparkle and dream as ever. Behind her in the hammock, Rilla Blythe was curled up, a fat, roly-poly little creature of six years, the youngest of the Ingleside children. She had curly red hair and hazel eyes that were now buttoned up after the funny, wrinkled fashion in which Rilla always went to sleep. Shirley, 
the little brown boy as he was known in the family, who's who was asleep in Susan's um. Surely, the little brown boy as he was known in the family. <clears throat> I need to take a drink. I occasionally get crap in my throat. If I tried to power through, it just did not work. Surely, the little brown boy, as he was known in the family who's who, was asleep in Susan's arms. He was brown-haired, brown-eyed, and brown-skinned, with very rosy cheeks. And he was Susan's especial love. After his... <clears throat> After his birth, Anne had been very ill for a long time. And Susan mothered the baby with a passionate tenderness, which none of the other children, dear as they were to her, had ever called out. Dr. Blythe had said that, but for her, he would never have lived. I just gave... I gave him life just as much as you did, Mrs. Dr. Dear, Susan was wont to say. He is just as much my baby as he is yours. And indeed, it was always to Susan that Shirley ran, to be kissed for bumps and rocked to sleep, and protected from well-deserved spankings. Susan had conscientiously spanked all the other Blythe children when she thought they needed it for their soul's good, but she would not spank Shirley, nor allow his mother to do so. Once Dr. Blythe had spanked him and Susan had been stormily indignant, that man would spank an angel, Mrs. Dr. Dear, that he would she had declared bitterly, and she would not make the poor doctor a pie for weeks. She had taken Shirley with her to her brother's home during his parents' absence, while all the other children had gone to Avonlea, and she had three blessed months of him all to herself. Nevertheless, Susan was very glad to find herself back at Ingleside, with all her darlings around her again. Ingleside was her world, and in it she reigned supreme, even Anne seldom questioned her decisions, much to the disgust of Mrs. Rachel Lynde of Green Gables, who gloomily told Anne whenever she visited Four Winds that she was letting Susan get to be entirely too much of a boss and would live to rue it. Here is Cornelia Bryant coming up the harbor road, Mrs. Dr. Dear, said Susan. She will be coming to unload three months' gossip on us. I hope so, said Anne, hugging her knees. I'm starving for Glen St. Mary gossip, Susan. I hope Miss Cornelia can tell me everything that has happened while we've been away. Everything. Who has got born or married or drunk. Who has died or gone away or come or fought or lost a cow or found a bow. It's so delightful to be home again with all the dear Glen folks. And I want to know all about them. Why, I remember wondering as I walked through Westminster Abbey which of her two especial bows Millicent Drew would finally marry. Do you know, Susan, I have a dreadful suspicion that I love gossip. Well, of course, Mrs. Dr. Dear, admitted Susan. Every proper woman likes to hear the news. I'm rather interested in Millicent Drew's case myself. Excuse me. I never had a bow. Hold on. Another burp. I never had a bow, much less two. And I do not mind now, for being an old maid does not hurt when you get used to it. Millicent's hair always looked to me as if she had swept it up with a broom. But the men do not seem to mind that. You know, I have been listening to Susan's voice for a long time. Now we're good. A little nicer, kind of. I see only her pretty, pecant, mocking little face, Susan. That may be very... Dang it. That may very well be, Mrs. Dr. Dear. The good book says that favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But I should not have minded finding that out for myself. If it had been so ordained... I have no doubt we will all be beautiful when we are angels, but what good will it do us then? Speaking of gossip, however, 
They do say that poor Mrs. Harrison Miller over harbor tried to hang herself last week. Oh, Susan, calm yourself, Mrs. Dr. Dear. She did not succeed. But I really do not blame her for trying, for her husband is a terrible man. But she was very foolish to think of hanging herself and leaving the way clear for him to marry some other woman. If I had been in her shoes, Mrs. Dr. Dear... I would have gone to work to worry about him so that he would try to hang himself instead of me. Not that I hold with people hanging themselves under any circumstances, Mrs. Dr. Dear. What is the matter with Harrison Miller anyway? said Anne impatiently. He's always driving someone to extremes. Well, some people call it religion and some call it cussedness, begging your pardon, Mrs. Dr. Dear, for using such a word. It seems they cannot make out which it is in Harrison's case. There are days when he growls at everybody because he thinks he is foreordained to eternal punishment, and then there are days when he says he does not care and goes and gets drunk. My own opinion is that he's not sound in his intellect, for none of that branch of the Millers were. His grandfather went out of his mind. He thought he was surrounded by big black spiders, they crawled over him and floated in the air about him. I hope I shall never go insane, Mrs. Dr. Dear, and I do not think I will, because it is not a habit of the Bakers. But if an all-wise providence should decree it, I hope it will not take the form of big black spiders, for I loathe the animals. As for Mrs. Miller, I do not know whether she really deserves pity or not. There are some who say she just married Harrison despite Richard Taylor— which seems to me a very peculiar reason. Mm -mm. Mouth noise. Which seems to me a very peculiar reason for getting married. But then, of course, I am no judge of things matrimonial, Mrs. Dr. Dear. And there's Cornelia Bryant at the gate. So I'll put this blessed brown baby on his bed and get my knitting. Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today. While we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Bree Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of Rainbow Valley. <sighs> All right. Chapter one is done. Woo! I like starting new seasons. Um, I'm actually really excited to, like, I wanted to finish this series, um, but I'm actually really excited to, like, start on something new. Um, and this Christmas, I haven't decided yet. Um, if you want to vote on upcoming books, um, I already have the two books after this planned because it was requested. Um, but if you want to vote on upcoming books in my newsletter, bideatatimebooks.com, it's a uh, pop-up on the website or at the, across the top, there'll be a banner, um, to sign up. Um, but if you want the chance to vote on upcoming books, I'm going to start sending that out in the next... I don't know. So I, I already have the next couple ones planned, but then once I'm on like the book before the final book or once I start the final book, I'll start sending out newsletters with voting for like, hey, what do you want to hear next kind of things um, with like options. So if you want a chance to vote on what comes next, go sign up for that so you don't miss out. I also announce like um, by the time this is done, I will have announced uh, t-shirts will be available. Um yeah, so just go sign up for it if you're interested in being a participant in what is happening next. Ow, thanks guys. <laughs>